your Second Amendment right. Proudly celebrated on the Lars Lusson Show. Welcome back to the program. Glad to have you with me. If you want to join into the best conversation in talk journalism, it's right here every night on your radio, and we're glad to have you with me. 866-HEY-LARS. That's 866-439-5277. Emails go to talk at LarsLarson.com. They're calling it a major victory for President Obama, House Speaker John Boehner, and a law, both of them, and a loss for Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell, who fought unsuccessfully to keep the Patriot Act unchanged, and instead its replacement has been voted through the Senate, uh, 67 to 32. Big changes coming to that law, and I thought we'd get Nathan Lemer on, senior policy analyst at the R Street Institute, to talk about what kind of changes the so-called USA Freedom Act is going to bring to the Patriot Act. Nathan, thanks for taking the time, and what is the biggest change? Yeah, the biggest change. Uh, first off, thanks for having me on the sure. show. Um, the biggest, the biggest change uh, that the USA Freedom Act has uh, has done is it ended uh, the bulk collection of phone metadata, the phone records of Americans, yep. and it also increased uh, significantly transparency and accountability um, to the FISA court, which is the secret court, and also accountability for Congress so that they can actually know what they're going to vote on. So we end the data, the metadata collection, which a lot of people are saying, well, gee, it's never actually helped us stop a terrorist attack. And yet I've heard I've heard people say the contrary. They say that that there are cases where the data has been used. What's the truth? Yeah, the, the truth is that over the past two years, uh, the, the narrative has changed. Uh, right after the Snowden revelations, we heard that there were dozens of uh, terrorist attacks that were, that, that were uh, foiled. But now the reality comes out that actually there hasn't been any uh, terrorist plot um, foiled because of Section 215, uh, the metadata collection. Uh, the President's Privacy and Civil Liberties Board has said this, it has said that, and then so have a number of civil libertarians a number of senators who have the information at their uh, at their disposal. All right, so we're going to get rid of that, uh, but there are still concerns that getting rid of it is going to uh, put a put a crimp in the ability of the United States to gather data necessary to uh, you know to fend off terrorist attacks, especially those where people here may be radicalized by folks overseas. I mean, we've just seen uh, this one suspect today shot to death in Boston by a police officer and an FBI agent who, who he confronted with a knife. And, I, I'm, and they're saying this may be uh, an indication that there's a cell uh, that had gone active in Boston uh, and that this is the result. Uh, that's a good question. I think the best part about this reform is that it actually brought in the Director of National Intelligence, uh, James Clapper, as well as the new Attorney General, Loretta, Loretta Lynch, to basically say that this bill would not affect any of their um, uh, their efforts and their operations. Um, in fact, actually, because of the lack of metadata and because of uh, no longer rebuilding a haystack to find a needle, it actually allows them to better target uh, the real bad guys, without actually infringing on the civil liberties of millions of Americans who are doing nothing wrong. All right. Well, I hope they're right about that. And about the additional transparency, is it necessarily a good thing to have additional transparency for an agency for agencies that are trying to track down the secret activities of people who are, who are trying to plot some kind of attack on the United States? Well, I would say that with the second uh, district court that recently ruled that the NSA's a bulk collection of metadata was illegal, according to the way that United States Congress actually passed the Patriot Act, right. that it is important for Congress. Because, you know, the author of the Patriot Act, uh, Representative Jim Sensenbrenner, even said, this is not what we passed. We never authorized the bulk collection of metadata. Unfortunately, it had been interpreted by the secret court. And so the only way that Congress can actually know what the secret court is interpreting, what the NSA or CIA or FBI is actually doing, is for them to actually have the information at their disposal. Um, again, the best part about this bill is that it was endorsed by the intelligence community, basically saying this transparency is good because it would open the door for, um, for Congress to know what's going on, but it wouldn't necessarily make the information specifically available to the public. Um, there would still be that closed-door uh, question of, uh, of what, what would be available to the public, but allowing Congress to know what they're actually voting on. Are they saying, then, that, that all of these select committees, both in the House and the Senate, that, were, that, that have a constitutional mandate to, to do oversight on some of the secret activities of, of America's agencies, like the CIA and the NSA and others, uh, that they haven't been doing their job or that they haven't been able to do their job? That's a great question, because the House uh, Intelligence Committee is actually uh, on the verge of looking at some reforms to open up 
uh, information to House rank and file members. Uh, members like Representative Justin Amash or Senator Rand Paul have opened up that question of uh, basically how do we know what we're voting on. And, you know, if you're a member of Congress, uh, a lot of that information is based upon what the uh, caucus is telling you or what leadership is telling you. And some of those questions that uh, members have aren't always answered sufficiently under the uh, current law. Are there any other major changes that come about because of this, or is, or is that pretty much it, the stopping of the metadata and additional transparency over the entire program? Uh, you know, one other side of this that is important is it, it, it brings back the sunset. You know, the, the whole reason we had this conversation was because of a sunset. Yep. It moves the sunset four years from now, which means that within the next four years, Congress is going to be forced to reevaluate the law's Um, at their disposal. That's a huge limiting principle for conservatives that we should be excited about because laws like Obamacare or uh, laws like uh, like surveillance reform should be reevaluated on a regular basis to make sure that it's the way that the people want it and the way that it's actually supposed to be working. Well, see, and, and I have that concern as well, because some of this is the concern that they have the, t- the tools to actually do the job, find the bad guys and stop them before they kill somebody. But the other concern I've got is that is that uh, in some cases they may be going too far. In some cases, they may not be going far enough. And I guess if I can compare it, we have an agency that's supposed to make sure that bad guys don't get weapons on airplanes. And we find out as of this week that they're, 90, they're failing 95% of the time. If, if other agencies have a, a similar record of failure, then, then maybe we should have reason to be concerned. And there may be times in the future where they'll sunset a law. The, the, the law's sunset may suggest that they need additional capabilities, more, not fewer. No, that's absolutely correct. Fourteen years ago, how many people were using their cell phones or Twitter or Facebook weren't even around back then? Um, You know, tools for national security are absolutely essential and important. However, they should evolve with the times to respect our national our civil liberties, but at the same time uh, targeting the people that need to be targeted. Um, in a way that's effective and uh, and keeps the keeps the bad guys from being able to do what they what they want to do at the same time keeping us safe. All right, and and the objections of people like Mitch McConnell who say we actually needed to keep those those uh, provisions in place, uh, you know, how are those going to be satisfied going forward, or is McConnell simply going to say this is this is the decision we made and and we're going to have to live with it? Um, you know, that's a great point. I, I would say that the how I've noticed that House leadership which was two years ago very stubborn about NSA surveillance reform, has come around a long way. And I think in some ways Senate leadership is kind of following that same track where they're finally having this debate. And over the course of this debate, we've seen their arguments change and them acknowledging that maybe there is an opportunity for reform. Um, But again, with the sunset and with the oversight and with the Intelligence Committee commitment um, to looking at the issue going forward, um, hopefully, if there are any issues that arise, whether from a civil liberties perspective or a security concern, that Congress will have the ability to move forward on that um, adequately and quickly. You know, it's interesting that at the same time we're talking about this, we find out today the FBI is using a fleet of secret airplanes under fictitious company names to go out and do surveillance from the air that uh, that I haven't heard any members of Congress talk about. I'd be curious to know what Senator Wyden thinks about that. I know that Ron Wyden had asked James Clapper, you know, are you doing any of this surveillance uh, through on the metadata program? And Clapper flatly denied it and then later on said he'd forgotten about it or, you know, <laughs> didn't remember the truth, whatever excuse he wanted to use. But apparently they've been flying these planes over a whole bunch of American cities. I'm wondering if we're going to find out more things that the government is doing that even the Congress isn't aware of. Hey, Nathan, it's a pleasure to have you on the program, but I'm up uh, up against the clock, and I appreciate your work at the R Street Institute. Thanks. Thank you very much. You bet. Nathan Lemer, Senior Policy Analyst at the R Street Institute. In a moment, there's a growing online movement to vote for Hillary because she's a woman, but Carly Fiorina is running, and she's much more qualified. We'll talk about that with Roger Simon, and get your phone calls and your emails. The Lars Larson Show. 